house here thing. Our lovely lighting person, would it be possible to have some house lights? Uh, I love, it's nice to be able to see people. Thank you so much. That's great, because uh, there's such a, uh, I was saying to Nilla, she's uh, obviously booked the intelligence and handsome crowd this evening, kind of thing. It's, you know, sometimes. But we're, we're keeping the great British tradition going of having the empty front row at a poetry know, reading, which is quite an interesting thing, isn't it? Like, it always happens, doesn't it? Um, about, about 10 years ago, um, no. <laughs> now we've got the great. There you go. It's fantastic, isn't it? You just have to invite, don't you? See, embarrassment and invite. All the ladies. All the ladies. That's fantastic. <laughs> About ten years ago, um, I I worked uh, as writer in residence at a, a prison, and um, people kept asking me, would I write them love poems? It's quite interesting how love poetry is kind of, you know, will kind of will kind of shine into the sort of the darkest corners. But what was quite interesting is is that, you know, uh, a, a young man in prison would say to me, can you help me write, can, can you write me a love poem from a girlfriend? And I'd say, no, um, you can write one, but I'll give you a bit of assistance. So tell me something about her. And they would say, well, uh, she makes me happy and she makes me dinner. And, um, and after a while, it would go on and on and on and on like this. And I'd say, well, that's very well, but can you tell me something about her? And then the, and they would always conclude with this line, to prove how much they love their girlfriend or wife or children or whatever. Well, I would die for my girlfriend. And I would say, yeah, you're a bloody coward, aren't you? Because that's the easy way out. You don't know who this person is, but you wouldn't live. You wouldn't live. Would you? You haven't got the courage to live, to face your own demons, to sort yourself out. Death and love. It seems to me, as we read the classic love stories, they're full of madness. I mean, if, if Heathcliff and Cathy lived on your street now, the police would be round every night. <laughs> would they not? This is, it is a classic, classic, uh, terrible, people who, who seriously need therapy and are suffering with the most god-awful codependence uh, and issues. Uh, and yet, when they're written down, you know, they're, they're turned into these great love stories. But actually, love is not love. Love is not love at all in most of these stories. Uh, because they, they, they don't see each other. They're projections. In fact, most people, you know, we, we all experience love. But to actually do something with that, that, that takes a, a very courageous heart. It's very easy to die. It's very easy to wink out of existence. But it's, it's completely something else to live and to kind of turn up day after day, you know, and consider another person as much as yourself. That's, that's really something. Uh, and, to, and for that person to not be the sum of your projections and reactions. And um, uh, the Aeneid, of course, is, is kind of based on this. Um, Dido and Aeneas is, is very much one of these insane love stories uh, where um, they just don't seem to see each other at all and at the end she uh, you know, uh, Aeneas goes away and uh, she, she grabs a sword, stabs herself and throws herself on the fire kind of thing it, it's, re it's really quite, quite bizarre so um, uh, I just want to kind of give you a, a very different take on it because I don't know if you if, if we, if we kind of we talk about things. Nimmer will tell you uh, afterwards when you kind of go, that John is a funny guy, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm always the one who will say the wrong thing. That's that's me. And so uh, I challenge love. I challenge people who say love, and I challenge the literature of love uh, because very often it isn't. I, I'd like to see things about real love, about people finding the courage. And so in my uh, um, Dido and Aeneas, if I was to write it, if I was Virgil, um, I'd, have a, I'd have a sort of telling him to, to naff off, basically. And, um, uh, and, and this would be the note that she might write him. I sing of the arms of a man. I sing of the arms of a woman. I sing of the, deceit, of the sea of delusion we mistakenly call love. Tell me, muse, of the soldier, hero, coward. Tell me of the one who is mighty in battle, deep in words, powerful in action, 
the one who in truth is little more than a terrified child at heart. Tell me, muse, the lies of the gods. Tell me about the thing that people call love, which is not love at all. The coward would die for the gods, for his country, but he will not live for life. I sing of the tragedies told as truths by the storytellers. I sing of the closed heart of fear. I sing of true courage. Now that my heart is shipwrecked, I sing of the love that knows no fear. So uh, we'd go a different way, really, with that. Um, the second story is a, is, a, is a much nicer thing. The second piece is a, is a much nicer thing. Um, Liang and Zhu, I think that's how you say it, um, were, I guess it's in the kind of the, the, the late 200s, early 300s uh, in China. Uh, and um, Zhu was this, this very, in sort of, she was the, the only, only daughter out of, out of nine children. And um, she meets this young man, Liang, a scholar, uh, and they, they feel this kind of uh, strong affinity for each other, but then she's kind of, they study together and, and start loving each other, and then she's summoned home. Um, in fact, well, actually, she has to study in disguise. This is it. I'm looking at my notes here as I do it. She has to study in disguise, uh, and she's always trying to hint that she's actually a woman, you see, kind of thing. And um, so she sets up this, this thing where she's going to introduce him to her sister, um, and, uh, but the sister's going to be her. Uh, but that doesn't work out, uh, um, and uh, uh, because she's uh, she she's um, married off to this this wealthy man, and so uh, Lang, because of this, dies of heartbreak, um, and on the day of what is supposed to be her wedding, which somehow is taking place very near the graveyard, it's just a nice coincidence, uh, the wind starts blowing and this storm comes up, and uh, and she can't get past the grave and she begs the ground to open up and swallow her. The grave opens up, and she throws herself inside and, and joins Liang. Um, and then, as the sun comes out, these two butterflies rise up and fly off, and they're Aww. held together forever. So, a, ve a very long introduction for a poem that's about this big. <laughs> Butterfly lovers. Somewhere over a field of seed heads and summer flowers, Two butterflies journey a life of nectar and sun. The way they dance, they must be the spirits of lost lovers reunited. There you go. Long intro and a very short, uh, short poem. And uh, this word, I don't know how to say this. Can you, can you rescue me here? <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, the Chung, Chung Yang Jeon um, is, is a Korean uh, love story. And um, it begins with a, a young man called Mong, who uh, goes out to get some, some fresh air, and he sees Chung Hyang on a swing, and it's love at first sight. Um, so he goes to talk to her mother, and she gives permission, uh, and they get married that day. Uh, but amazingly, these, fa these fathers and families that seem to get in the way, Mong's father has to move to another region. He's a government official, and, um, uh, and so he's taken with him. And in the, in the, in the town that, uh, that Chang Hyang lives in, uh, the, the beautiful young woman, uh, a new lord arrives and kind of falls in love with her for himself, of course, and, uh, and, and does everything to kind of try and own her. Uh, and she says, yes, but I'm married, leave me alone. And so he throws her in jail um, uh, and to punish her. So meanwhile, these are very complex tales. Uh, Yong um, becomes a state royal inspector and so he, his job is actually to go around kind of looking at the lords, but he has to disguise himself uh, in order to kind of get into this kind of uh, this royalish house. Um, and so he dresses as a, as a madman and a mendicant, uh, but um, somehow they connect together and they recognize each other. And they live happily ever after. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Thank God for that. They live happily ever after. So. No police or anything. <laughs> no therapist. 
And in, just, just reading this tale, because uh, if you read the longer version of the tale, they end up kind of dressing up in all these disguises and things and, uh, and sort of somehow sort of trying to kind of, kind of move through their situations. And it just really made me think how kind of, you know, we kind of live in a field of love, really, but because we're kind of caught up with our own stuff all the time, you know, love comes hammering on the door and we miss it all the time, you know, kind of thing. We, we miss uh, uh, love rapping on our door. Love comes to us wearing many disguises. Though oftentimes we cannot recognize this stranger despite the clarity of its voice. Love wears so many guises so that it may travel to our door. It is the girl in the swing, the prostitute at the hotel bar, the prisoner at her window, the man without a home. Love, however, is always love. If we look into the depths of its eyes, we will see the truth beneath the form. If we can finally accept the truth that we are the heart of love, the beloved will arrive as we live the music of within. Thank you very much. And just to, just to do a little plug, not selling books, but there's a, I have a mailing list around uh, so if you want to kind of stay in touch with... Um, things that I'm doing and, and kind of are interested in, in kind of other events and, and things coming out, whatever. If you just put your name and your uh, email address on my mailing list, I'll, I'll add you on. Thank you so much. It's been lovely reading to you.